Um, how many people here like physics? Anybody like physics? Well, there's a couple of physics people. Why don't you put that picture up on the board there, and then I'll get a, uh, maybe a little laugh out of this. Okay, Tony's the only one I got that one. You get the, oh no, there you go. Okay, so Heisenberg's uncertainty principle talks about uh, many, many things, but it talks about that if you uh, want to know the position of something, you have to give up uh, knowing its momentum, right? If you study its momentum, you can't know its position. That, that's why the joke says, yeah, you're probably here, you know, to kind of know where you are or whatever. But this idea of, uh, of uncertainty principle also has a facet of it of, of there is a there is a corollary between subject and object. There's some sort of, right? As you, like for example, if, if you study a, a light and you're looking for light as a wave, lo and behold, you find out that light is a wave. However, if you study light as a particle, uh, what you'll find is you'll discover light as a particle. And so uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is, is because we're talking about a subject that None of us really uh, truthfully know too much about, but yet we know a lot about it. At least we've been exposed to a lot about it. Um, and so let me read something to you, uh, a book that I've, uh, I've been reading. Uh, this is talking about our, our intellect, our mind, and it says this. It says, yes, the mind is necessary, but it can't do everything. Yes, the mind is receptive, but reason is not our only antenna. We also need our bodies, our emotion, our hearts, our nose, our ears, our eyes, our taste, our souls. Yes, the mind can achieve great things, but through over-control, it can also limit what we can know. Yes, the mind can think great thoughts, but also bad ones and limiting ones. The mind can be a gift and a curse. Yes, the mind can tell left from right, but it cannot perceive invisible things such as love, eternity, fear, wholeness, mystery, or the divine. Yes, the mind can discern um, consistency, logic, and fairness, but it seldom puts these things into practice. Yes, the mind and reason are necessary, but they must learn to distinguish between what lies beyond its reach, um, the pre-rational and the transrational. Yes, the mind is brilliant, but the more we observe it, the more we see it, uh, it is also obsessive and repetitive. Yes, the mind seeks the truth, but it can also create lies. Yes, the mind can connect us with others, but can also keep us apart. Yes, the mind is very useful, but when it does not recognize its own finite viewpoint, it is also useless. Yes, the mind can serve the world, but in fact, it largely serves itself. Yes, the mind can make necessary distinctions, but also divides in thought what is undivided in nature and in the concrete, which I thought was a very fascinating insight in that. Let me read that one again. The mind can make necessary distinctions, but it also divides in thought what is undivided in nature and in the concrete. Yes, the mind is needed, but we also need other ways of knowing or we will not know well, fully or freely. Yes, the mind is good at thinking, but so much so that humans like Descartes think they are their thinking. Yes, the mind likes to think, but until it learns to listen to others, to the body, the heart, and all senses, it also uses itself to block everything it does, <clears throat> it does not like to do or to acknowledge. Yes, the mind is our friend, but when we are obsessive or compulsive, it can also be our most dangerous foe. Yes, the mind welcomes education, but also needs to be uneducated, to learn how much of what we know is actually mere conditioning or prejudice. So this is the part I want to get to now after thinking about all that. As a result, the great religions of the world found methods of compartmentalization, um, but not eliminate the over-control of thinking, rational mind, through practices such as, guess what? Prayer, meditation, contemplation. This was or is the new mind which allows other parts of us to see, other things to be seen. 
the rational mind to then be uh, reintegrated, but now as a servant instead of a master. <clears throat> I, I read that and I thought, wow, this is, this is really what we need to, what, where we battle, I think, at least where I battle. Uh, in, this, in our talks, in our teaching, in our readings on prayer. Because what we find, or what I find myself doing mostly is trying to come to understandings within my, what? My mind, my intellect, uh, and what I know. Uh, and so I've been battling, you know, these, these kidney stones and everything. And so uh, last night, Pete and Connie were over the house, and Connie said, Can I, let, me, let me pray for you. I said, that's fine. She goes, now I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna pray you some kind of, you know, she, she knows me, you know, very, pretty well. She goes, uh, I'm gonna use some kind of, it's gonna sound religious sounding to you. I go, you know what, I don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care, right, right, Connie? I don't care what it sounds like, right? Like when you had, well, listen, so uh, this isn't me, this are, these are women who have get given birth and have kidney stones. They say kidney stone pain is worth. That's not, I'm not me saying that, that's them saying that, okay? I don't know, I've never had a baby. I've watched two, it didn't look that painful to me, to be honest, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she's not, she's downstairs. <laughs> so, when you're in that kind of pain, right? Can, he uses two words there, pre-rational and transrational. You almost have to, you almost to, 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 em, to em, embrace something more. It kind of is like, you know, I, like prayer is kind of like, pre-rational, right? It comes before you're, like, I don't care. Like, do, do whatever. You know, if, if it, I'll take anything if it might help. Do you ever feel that way? And so I think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice by all of our thinking. You know, he's not talking about Descartes. He, he thinks that his thinking is him. We're so much more than that, aren't we? We're so much more than just our thinking. And so prayer is this, is this, is this activity that we engage in that's pre-rational. It just is, right? To pray to this, this being, this God that's, we don't know where. He's, he's, not a, he's not in a place because he's not bound by space. He doesn't have a body like you and I. He's not male or female like the way we understand uh, uh, the sexes, right? He's, he's not that. And, and and it, 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 it's before our rational mind kind of, uh, uh, kind of takes over, or, or, or transrational. It's another way of talking about it. You know, it's, uh, it transcends the, the, the things that we can look around and we can know or see, which, which brings me back to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, right? Uh, there was a time when, with, with Newtonian thought, Everything just kind of followed in order, right? And then all of a sudden we start to learn more about, listen, I, I, I am no scientist. I am no, uh, you know, uh, physicist, anything like that, right? I love reading about it and just don't have to get myself in trouble because, and that'll be, I'll get like an email later on and go, well, Jeff, when you said that, that actually wasn't right. <laughs> you know, if we have any like nuclear scientists in here or whatever, they'll probably be the ones who will, Adam will write to me later on and go, Jeff, that wasn't exactly right. Uh, yeah, I know, whatever. But, but the, <laughs> right, Adam, right? That's okay. Uh, but the, 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 <laughs> the point is, that, I almost fell off of here. The point is this. Yeah. The point is, the point is, there's so much we don't know, right? There's so, but we think we know everything. But there's so much that is beyond our, our intellect, uh, Michelle and I uh, are watching, we love this one show, The Good Doctor. You ever see The Good Doctor? So we love this one show, and there's a scene in there, which I love that they have it. There's a Baptist minister in there, and some things are happening, and he has tumors, and, and they just start to go away, and they can't understand why. And somebody say, well, there's, you know, th there's a reason. We just don't know the reason yet. You know what I mean? And others who are, and it's, it's this idea that, that Heisenberg's principle, too, is we tend to see what it is we're looking for. I want that to stick in your mind for a minute. We tend to see what we're looking for. I was talking with some ladies downstairs before I came up here, and we were talking about how 
how, uh, like, so Pete, uh, uh, ha- my son had our, I bought a new little truck, right? And it's over at Pete's house. And he was looking at it for me. And it's a Dodge Dakota. And so when he left and was out driving, he said, I can't believe all the Dodge Dakotas that are out there on the road, right? He never noticed the Dodge Dakotas before, did he? Right? How many of you ever done that? You know, you buy a, you buy a car and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, right, Pete? All of a sudden, uh, yeah, you start seeing those cars everywhere. Holy smokes, I didn't realize. So I have a Jeep. Jeep people, we wave to each other. I don't know why we do it. We just wave to each other. I drive down the road, that's all I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm going to get like a, a, like a sticker of a hand up, just put on my wing. I don't have to do it anymore. There's my wave. You got it, right? Um, but we tend to see what we're looking for. So that's the mind, isn't it? That's the mind. When it comes to even Scripture, you know what I mean? You have a belief about something. Listen, you're, you're going to find something to support you. You're going to find what you're looking for. You want to find something wrong with somebody? You'll find it. You'll find it. Right? Because we have a tendency to, to find what it is we're looking for. And so, talking about prayer then... Is a, is a most difficult subject. Because how else do I do it but with thoughts and words? But words kind of fall short, I think, when it comes to this, right? Uh, if someone asked me last night, uh, you know, when I was, I knew my pain was coming. I, I knew it was, I told them, I said, it's about a three. Before they left, it was about a five, up to a five. Seven, I can tolerate. Eight, nine, and ten, I'm looking for, I say this, tongue in cheek, but not far from the truth. I'm looking for a gun. That's how bad the pain is. I'm telling you, you don't want that kind of pain. You just don't want that kind of pain. And uh, so Connie says, can I pray for you? I go, are you kidding, like, are you kidding me? Like, like, yeah. Well, I might use, I don't care what kind of words, you, I don't care what you say. Speak whatever language you want, I don't care. Right? Because I'll, 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 I'll try anything, I'll, right? It's, it, you know, but it doesn't make, prayer doesn't even make sense to me. I don't know if it does to you, but it just doesn't make sense. If I try to think of it with my rational mind, like it, it just doesn't make sense, right? How many have tried to do this before? Okay, uh, God loves me. Okay, I know God loves me. He cares for me like a father, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, like a father loves a child. How many of you fathers would do anything for your children? Just do anything, even to the point of a fault, Right? Sometimes we, we even do things, help them out, you know, to a fault sometimes, I think. I know I do. I don't know about you. Sometimes to a fault, right? And so I think, okay, if God's like a, a father, of course he doesn't. I'd, I'd do anything to k- keep my kids from experiencing pain. So certainly God would want to do that. Certainly, certainly my concept of God, he's capable of doing it. So now I have a dilemma. I believe my, I believe he doesn't want me in pain. I believe he's capable of not uh, taking the pain away from me, but yet I still have pain. It's the rational mind, isn't it? Trying to understand this. You know, and you'll get yourself all tied up in knots trying to figure this out. And, and sometimes I think we have to, he talked about this, sometimes the mind is good, but the mind gets in the way sometimes. Gets in the way. Sometimes we have to try to think in other, in other ways, in using other senses. And so his point in that whole chapter I just read to you was that's what prayer is. That's what prayer is. So next time you're thinking about prayer or whatever, think, think in terms of, well, this is, this doesn't, I'm not trying to make it make sense. This is because, because the world doesn't make sense. Because I, I don't understand. Because it is confusing. All I have left is prayer, is meditation, is contemplation. Are you following me? Okay. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer. We started it last week, right? Uh, we talked about, if you, have your, if you have your notes, this is last week's notes. Uh, we talked about prayer isn't, uh, isn't um, uh, a formula, Right? It's not a formula, something that you, that you, that you kind of just repeat over and over again. You know, so people like to do that, right? Because isn't that, think about it for a minute. Isn't that the, the rational mind kind of take over and, and, and be in charge of prayer? Right? Isn't it? 
hey, this prayer, the prayer of Jabez, this, this one works. Pray this prayer. Pray this prayer every day. Pray it four times a day. Are you following me? Right? Or even a, even, even a church saying, you know, the Lord's Prayer. Well, pray the Lord's Prayer. Right? Do say that prayer. Right? And, and so, and that's the, that's the rational mind trying to take over. You know what the rational mind always wants to do? It wants to control. Because the rational mind and the ego are one and the same, aren't they? It wants to take over. It wants to be in control. It wants to handle everything. And so, but prayer is something else. It's something else. Um, so part and parcel of, of this, of prayer, has to do somehow with the thing that Jesus talked about so much, and that is kingdom. Kingdom. To me, let me tell you what kingdom living is to me. You'll know my favorite scripture embodies kingdom living is John 10.10. 10. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life in its most abundant form. Because kingdom is, is now. Kingdom is now. Is it not yet? Sure, it's not yet. But everything that's, that's to come is not yet, but it can still be now. And that's hard to make sense of with your rational mind as well. But how do we approach kingdom living as a faith community? That's what we are, is a faith community. We're always wrestling between two questions, or at least I should say I'm always wrestling. You don't have to leave, but if you want to leave, you can. With, you can take them, down, yeah, take them downstairs, come on back, that's fine. It doesn't bother me. So we're always wrestling with two big questions. So I'll say it like this. I'll say it the way I like to say it. What is life in its most abundant form? Or, or what is kingdom living? Because right, kingdom living, living in God's kingdom is, 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 is by definition the most abundant thing you could ever possibly do in your life. Wouldn't you agree? In God's kingdom. We, we, we've, we've, we've made it that God's kingdom is some some location somewhere. God's kingdom is no location somewhere that one day that you'll, you'll go and, and, and live there. God's kingdom is a, is a way of living. That's why John 10.10 10 embodies this, this, this idea of kingdom living so well. She said, I've come. You might have life. God, God wants us to have life. He created life. He created all of life. He loves life. I hope you love life. And he said, I want you to have life in its most abundant form. And that's what he invites us into, doesn't he? He invites us to that. So the second question, if that's, a, if that's what he invites us to, the second question would be this. What are the practices that help us align to it? What are the practices? In other words, what's Jesus' invitation and how do we say yes? Don't you agree? What's Jesus' invitation, right? Abundant life, I, want you, I invite you to, what, what's his invitation? And how do I say yes to it? Because hey, who wouldn't want to say yes to it? Who wouldn't want to do that? And, and so that's why we're here. Not in this building, but that's true too. But that's why we're here today. That's why we're talking about this subject of prayer. And that's why we're talking about today this thing that we call the Lord's Prayer. I love it in the Bible, even it's in the English. You know, I looked up in the, in the, in the original language to it. It bears it out, although, although the, 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 the words aren't, aren't all there. You should study like Greek and Hebrew sometime to understand, you know, how these things work, how things don't translate, and what, what words they didn't have. And sometimes they have articles, sometimes they don't have articles, and sometimes, and, and, and the word order is all different, and, right? And so it's a complicated task doing it. Um, but it doesn't speak of uh, what, it doesn't give the idea of Jesus saying, this is what you should pray. You should know that. This isn't what you should pray. It's more of an idea of how is not even a great word. Not even, it's not even accurate. So you ask, well, what word is it? I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm not proficient enough in English language to even help us with that. But it's this idea, it's this, it's this, it's this manner, it's this, uh, it's this spirit of it, uh, right? It's, it's 
pre-rational, transrational. It's something, it's something else. And I don't, know how to, I don't know how to fully grasp that. I don't know how to help you fully grasp that. But I think, it, I think it's like the chicken and the egg. What comes first? I don't know. You have to go to prayer to try to figure out how to go to prayer. You know, try to figure out how to, how to, how to do this. Listen to this, Dallas Willard. How many of you like Dallas Willard? Dallas Willard is a great author. He passed away. If you could pick up any Dallas Willard book, I recommend, highly recommend it. If you ever see one, pick it up. He, said that, he says this, the address part of the prayer is of vital significance. We dare not slight or overlook it. I love this. Listen to what he says. He says this. This, meaning the address, the address of the Lord's Prayer, is one of the things that distinguishes prayer from worrying out loud. The address, so he says, listen, what what, what I'm about to talk about today are three words. Three words, that's it, just three words. He said, this address is so important, and I, I think I would agree. But sometimes we just, so often we just blow over things that we think are insignificant. And sometimes we, we spend so much mental energy on things that really aren't anything. I wish I could, I wish I could tell you right now what I'm thinking. <laughs> but, but I'll get myself in trouble, so I won't. See, I'm, get, I'm gaining wisdom. That's a joke, but I am. I am gaining wisdom. <laughs> Not to say things. So let's begin. Our, our, it's just a simple word, right? Our, Eugene Peterson writes this, with the our, O-U-R, Jesus puts himself in our company. With the our, we place ourselves in the company of Jesus and of all who pray. Wow. Wow. Man, I just stopped right there, and I was thinking, it's so true. But we can just go, go, we can go by that so fast. But Jesus said, this is the man who pray. You pray like this. Everybody pray like this. Our Father. Say it with, say it with me. Our Father. Whose Father is he? He's ours. He's our Father. Everyone who says that word, right, our Father, it puts us in their company. Now, we like, to, we like to identify, distinguish, and do all this stuff with it, but the fact of the matter is, Jesus says, our Father, our Father. This is Jesus, the Son. He doesn't say, you know, some people say, oh, you have to pray in Jesus' name. Well, he says, our Father. Now, we'll get into the Abba part and everything, right? I mean, you know, you all heard that before, right? The Abba uh, is like a is like a child, you know, calling up, you know, Papa, that sort of thing. We'll, we'll get into that. But it's also not just that. It's actually it's actually for uh, uh, somebody who's very very old. You ever you ever talk about how you ever hear what we talk about when you're young you're in diapers and then when you're going out of life you're in diapers again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, there's some truth to that, right? It's the same thing with this word Abba, in that culture in that context. Abba is there, but it's also Abba for the, for the very, very old. Why do you think that is? Because it carries also with it uh, something, something of reverence. So it, in one hand, it's something so familiar, so intimate, right? And, and, and that word, is, you know, you ever, if you ever hear somebody talk about, you know, well, my father, and, you know, no one says that. We say dad or whatever, right? This idea of Abba is that word. It's very familiar. But also it carries this idea of, of, a, of, a, of a deep, a deep respect and reverence when they go back to using Abba again. Isn't that fascinating? The creator, the creator, the creator of the universe. There's only one. There's only one. The creator of the universe, he's not just my God or my tribe's God, right? And that's what it was a lot of times too, right? It was, it was tribal religion, right? And, and, and it's unfortunate that we have, we have so kind of gone back to tribal religion, even within Christianity. I think there's more division within Christianity than there is within Christianity and other kind of religions. 
Sometimes we tolerate other religions more than we tolerate other sects or denominations within, within the Christian tradition. So he's not just the God. He's, let, me tell you, let me just say this to you. He's not just the God of all, uh, uh, of, of um, how do I want to say this? He's not just the God of all those who agree with you. Because that's kind of what we think sometimes. Right, well, you agree with, you, you know, someone asked me one time, they, they said, well, you know, what do you, you know, your church over there, like what do you guys, what do you guys believe? What do we believe? Wow, that's really, that's really broad, isn't it? What do we believe? I believe, like, the Bible. I mean, I well, we believe the Bible, too. I said, great, we have so much in common. Well, no, what I mean is, you know, like, what, I, I mean, like what, do you, like, what do you believe? I go, uh, give me a specific, because I can't just answer, you know, I, I mean, I don't know what you even say. You know what I mean? What, what do you believe? But what are we trying to do? We're trying to find out. Do our, do our, do how we see God with our, with our puny, finite mind. Does your puny, finite mind agree with mine? Like, like who cares? You know what I mean? People say, people come to me sometimes, you know, I like coming to your church. I don't agree with everything you say. Well, good, because I think you need help if you agree with everything I say. I think you're going to need to see a professional to get some help. Because when do you believe 100% of what anybody says? Do you? I do of Michelle, but other than that, <laughs> right? We, we don't believe 100% of what, what someone says. I don't expect that. And if someone does believe 100% of what I say, I go, we have, we have big trouble. Big trouble. Right? But that's the way church has been for a while, hasn't it? Right? You know, I, I'm the authority. I have the answers. And so I'll tell you what they are and you believe that. Well... Good luck with that because no one, no one has all the answers, right? And I'm going to lead you astray somewhere, somewhere. But God is the creator and lover of every single person on planet Earth, uh, past, present, and future. That's the truth. Let me tell you, all truth is from the Holy Spirit. All truth is God's truth. It's from the Holy Spirit. You don't care where you find it. I don't care where you find it. All truth is his truth. By definition, there's no other truth. It's all God's truth. And, and, and he is the God of all. John 3, 16. God so loved uh, the Christians in America. Right? I mean, come on. God so loved the world the world. Psalm 24, 1 says this, the earth is the Lord's. The whole earth is. It's his. And everything in it. You know, I've been thinking about something a lot lately. You know, we talk about the incarnation, right? If, you, if you'll spend some time and really look at and think about through scripture and through, just through other, other even other means, Right, the very first incarnation, and this is supported by the Bible, the very first incarnation is the world. That's the very first incarnation. Doesn't it, doesn't it say in the New Testament that, that he can be seen in everything that exists? Doesn't it say that? I'm just saying. That was, so the incarnation in Jesus wasn't a new thing. It was a repeated thing. The first incarnation is, is, is the world. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. It's all his. And, and I want you to know this. When you pray, you're joining with a most motley crew, right? From all over, from all different kinds of, of people and ways and places and people that don't think like you. What I mean by that is, I'm not talking about religion, I'm just talking about ways that people think in the world. Marie and I have this conversation a lot about, about the way, even from, from South America and America, the way we think and the way we behave and the way we understand. It's the most motley crew, diverse. It's... it's historic of all these 
of all these sons and daughters of the Most High. And you're joining with them. You see, when you pray, this is why I want to kind of get to us, when you pray, you're not alone. You're not alone when you pray. It's something so much more because, because He is our Father. He is our Father. That's why I think it's so important to remember that he or she, right, is our God. Our God. Not, 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 not my God in my particular way. He's our, our God. So I want to ask you this morning, what is your image of our God? What's your image of our God? Now it gets into kind of something important. Listen to this. I, I read a story. I want to read it to you. It said this. A family lost their 16-year-old son in a hunting accident. The mom, as as understandably, was just absolutely devastated. She went into a a, a period of of deep, dark mourning for over two years. She became a recluse for two years, never left her house. Even after two years, when she started to come out of this deep depression, it took her years and years and years to ever come back to a place of, she wouldn't have used the word, but I'll use the word, of of normalcy. Because anybody who's experienced something like that, you know that that normal becomes kind of relative. What does normal mean? There's a, it's actually a new normal. 20 years later, uh, we come back into her story and she's standing before her house sobbing as it burns to the ground to discover that night that her husband, that same moment, died of a heart attack. Hmm. How do you make sense of that? In a a well-intentioned, although although misguided, I would say, spiritual director decided he would have a dialogue with God in his journal to see if he could make sense of this tragedy. My brother called me the other day and said, Jeff, the chemo's not working and there's more spots on my liver. And so this, he tries to make sense of this tragedy and so here's his conclusion. He said, after dialoguing with God in his journal, he said, it all make perfect sense now God clearly did not want the woman to become a recluse again and stop going to church. So when he decided to call her husband home, he destroyed their house. That way she wouldn't be able to hide from the world. That, friends, is a toxic view of God. It's a toxic view of God. And it doesn't sound like the God that Jesus calls Abba. Does it to you? I mean, does it sound like, it does it sound like our Abba that Jesus is talking about in his prayer? It just reminds me again and again how I've, I've often said that your image of God is one of the most important things that you have, that you hold, is your image of him. Listen, I read this. It says, your God image shapes and colors absolutely everything about your spirituality from why we pray, how we pray, how we understand personal and global sufferings, and how we understand the problem of evil in the world. Your image of God colors Absolutely everything. And so we come to Abba, Father, the eternal creator of the universe, somehow, some way, desires a personal, uh, a personal intimacy, a personal relationship. Um, these are the only words that we have to use, right? And we have no other words. So we have to use these words that we use for one another to a spirit that we can't see, but we we have no choice. We have no choice but to use the same words. 
that he desires or she desires. God desires this relationship in some personal way with us. Romans 8, 15 and 16 says this, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. 1 John uh, 3 says this, uh, so what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Our Abba, our Papa. And that is what we are. I don't think it's in your notes somewhere, but I, I encourage you to write this down or memorize this or whatever. And that's this, unhealthy images of God elicit unhealthy behaviors. An unhealthy image of God will elicit in you and in me unhealthy behaviors. A couple important things to remember, and I've already touched on these, but I'll just say them again. Uh, two important um, things that we need to keep in mind when we, when we talk about our Father. First is this, is that God is spirit. He is spirit. He's not male as you and I understand gender. He's not male. The scripture, listen, is full of references to the maternal, feminine characteristics of God. It's full of it. It's all through it. So it's important that we address these, uh, these objections, okay? And you didn't know that. Second, second, this is really, really important. And that's this. No matter how good they were, our human fathers have misrepresented our heavenly father in some way. You just need to know that. Your, heaven, your earthly father has misrepresented the idea of Abba in some way. But it's, unfortunately, it's the only thing that we have, isn't it? It's the only thing that we have to, to make some sort of connection so we use this language that we have. I read, a, I read a story of a woman, she was 99 years old when she died. Sadly, most of her life, she had spent, uh, uh, so, so when you hear this, try to, try to put yourself, and don't th so think about the woman, but think about yourself. Most of her life, she spent guilt-ridden over her past. She had a very promiscuous past. Most of her life, she spent guilt-ridden over that. And if you watch, uh, if you watch Good Doctor, this Baptist minister comes in, he's guilt-ridden over bad advice he gave somebody and they committed suicide. He's just guilt-ridden over this thing. And so she feared death and was terrified by the thought of facing God. Terrified. At the wake, one of her friends commented, you know, Irene would have been a different person if only she had had a different God. Man, just let that sink in for a minute. A You're saying, wait a minute, a different God? I thought there's only one God. There's only one God. And the trouble is we think we have them all figured out. We think we have them all figured out. To name God as Father in the Lord's Prayer I think is the beginning is a commitment to having a healthy image of God. To, 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 to say that, to, to that be on your mind, our, he's our, but he's our father, he's our Abba, is a commitment to a healthy image of God. A healthy image of God should bring out the very best in you <clears throat> and, and that should also help bring out the very best in others, a healthy image of God. When we, when we discover our truest identity in him. Let me read again. 
It coaxes, us, it coaxes us to be transparent, to lovingly open ourselves to every single moment that calls for self-sacrifice and self-forgetfulness. And indeed, that's the fingerprint of a Christian, a little Christ. And in an excellent way to define holiness, selfless, sacrificial love for others as an expression and response to God's love in our lives. To be as close to others as a father is to his children. Again, the attitude of Abba becomes the measure and benchmark for the way of a, of a disciple. Living the Lord's Prayer. This is in a book that I'm reading by Albert Haas. That he is our Abba. That he's our Father. Listen, s- spend time right now. I mean, I'm out of time already. Spend time on, on, on the, the thought and try to spend time on it not in your, not in your rational mind. Of, uh, he's our Father. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't have uh, dibs on him because of, uh, of certain things that we believe inside these walls. We don't have dibs on him. He's our Father, those who call him Abba. And he's our Father. And the last thing is this. I'll just touch on it real quick. And that's the word, uh, our Father, where? 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 It's a weird thing, isn't it? Because we already know he's not, he's not where. He's everywhere. He's, he's, listen, not everything is God, but God is in everything. The scripture's clear on that. Totally clear on that. But our Father in heaven, what is that? What does that mean? Heaven. Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say surely the darkness will hide me and, and the light became night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. They've discovered that even in a black hole where they thought was nothing, there, lo and behold, is something, and it is light. Because in him there is no darkness. The place that we thought, if there is ultimate darkness, where nothing resides, we've come to discover uh, it's not true. It's not true. It's not, it's not a vacuum. A vacuum that we say, in, by definition, uh, holds nothing, is, is empty, is wrong. The vacuum that we found has light. Acts 17. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone, everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they would inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live, we move, and we have our being. As some of our own poets have said, we are his offspring. This theme is found throughout all of Scripture. And it's been throughout all of church history. Where is God? God is here. God is now. God is always. God is everywhere. Uh, A lot of scholars believe that a much better translation of our Father who art in heaven is actually our Father in the heavens. In the heavens. In other words, our Father who fills every molecule from the farthest solar system 
to inside of my own lungs. Our Father, who already floods this place and fills the atmosphere. Another preacher said it this way, John Ortberg. Our Father, who is closer than the air that we breathe. How do you get closer than that? It's, it's pre-rational. It's trans-rational. See, this is, the, this, is, this is getting closer to a true picture of who he is. But the minute, the minute we start to think, we start to discover him. I love, I read to Pete and Connie yesterday, uh, this other book that I have. It says that as we get closer to God, it's as though he draws back away from us. Sounds bad, right? No. To draw us in deeper to him. As we draw close to him. As we think we understand, he draws back and we realize that we don't. And it makes us draw closer in. The Bible, the Bible says it like this, deep calls unto deep and it draws us in closer and closer. I'm going to leave you just with this last quote from a book. My starting point is that we're already there. We cannot attain the presence of God because we're already totally in the presence of God. I, I gotta read that again. You just gotta hear it again. I'm not even done with the quote. My starting point is that we are already there. I'm already there. I can't attain the presence of God because I'm already totally in the presence of God. What's absent is awareness. What's absent is awareness. Little do we realize that God is maintaining us in existence with every breath we take. As we take another, it means God is choosing us now and now. And now, and now, and again, and again, and now, and now, and over and over again. He's choosing us, he's choosing you right now, at this moment, and again. Because his presence is everywhere. It's here. It's in you. The question is just awareness. Awareness. And, and, and friends, the point I want to leave you with is this, and we're not going to discover that with our rational mind. As good as your rational mind is, you're not going to discover it with that. So where do we land? We land with prayer. We land with prayer. We can talk about how, how medical community and science has discovered how prayer is good for you. I didn't, I, I'm getting to play. I don't need them to tell me that. That's great. I don't need them to tell me that. Hope you get to the place where in your life where you, I don't need that either. And I don't know what prayer is for you. Don't know what it is. Don't know what it looks like. Don't know how you do it. Don't know how you're going to start doing it. Don't know how you're going to get into it. But I know you should, you must. Because it's where the awareness of his presence comes from. You got my, my text message, you know, when I had my, my, my pain all day long, my, my email, right? I was praying all day long. I wasn't, I wasn't on my knees. I was, I, was, I was, listen, when you're in pain like that, you're acutely aware of life, of life, of your own life, of the life of others. And so I can tell you, I prayed all day long. Well, Jeff, I, you know, that's just, no, I'm telling you, I prayed all day long. Prayed all day long. Not in the way that, that we talk about prayer. Well, did you go, you know, were you on your knees? Or, you know, location, you know, body position, all that kind of stuff. Man, all that, listen, when you, when you have to, when you have to connect somehow, some way, when things are beyond your scope of understanding, reason, all that kind of stuff, all that stuff goes out the way. None of that stuff matters. None of that stuff matters. When the doctor says the, the chemo's not working to my brother and there's more spots. What does a rational mind do? I don't know, panic, worry, 
fear, everything. And so I want to say, I want to say the, the most trite Christian thing. We say, oh, you should pray. But we should. But we should. And you should. But you should understand it as something, as something so much more than what we have been taught and the way we have been led to think about it. Right? Allow yourself in a time of, of meditation to come to a place where, 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 where you, are, you are understanding, I, I don't know how to say this, but understanding somewhere other than your rational mind. Sounds mystical, doesn't it? Yeah? Kind of sounds mysterious, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And that's God. That's God. He's mysterious. He's mystical. He's more than our rational minds can can contain so we better find that's not serving us well we better find other ways and I don't know where we're going to go with this next to be honest with you (laughs) we did three words today I don't know where we're going to go I don't know how long we're going to stay here but I know I I want to linger in it a long time why don't you stand Our Father, our Abba, there's so much we don't know, there's so much we think we understand, we just, we just don't. Help us to stop trying to, to understand everything. Lord, I, I, we, we, we as, a, as a group this morning call to you together our our abba and we know it's even more than just the hour from this room from all those across all of time throughout all of history they call our abba seek you help us in our in our times of prayer in our times of meditation and contemplation to, to bring our rational mind under the direction, the, the control, I might even say, of, of you and your spirit. God, that we might somehow connect with the divine in ways that, that we never even dreamed possible. Because we limit ourselves with our own thoughts. So help us by your spirit, God, to move beyond whatever that means. And it could even maybe, maybe for some here this morning, it may even can seem scary or seem non-Christian or something. I don't know. I don't know where everybody is. But to move beyond and to, and to, and to move into realms that uh, that you reside in. I, I don't even have any more words to, to use, Lord. We just thank you, God, that you are our Abba. Amen. Amen. Thanks, friends. Have a great day.